Support for Tom's Brain comes from Uber. Get your free £10 credit by using the code UberTomPod. T-O-M-P-O-D. Join now and get your first £10 ride for free. cocoon. This is a place where I come to record when somebody is in the house. Usually I like to record when there's nobody in the house and even though it's just coming up to midnight I um, and I know that my parents are asleep I, I just I can't relax. I, I can't feel like I'm myself, like I'm free to say whatever I want. And I do want to be free to say whatever I want on this podcast, especially at times like this, because I've been awake quite a few hours today, which is unusual for me, but it's 2015 and I'm on a new trajectory and I've been sticking to it, as I told you at the end of the last podcast. I was going to set this weekly, and better late than never, right? I mean, this just means that you have to wait even less until next week's podcast. I do have a valid reason as to why I couldn't record the podcast earlier. And that was simply because I was too focused on my writing. I've been very focused on my writing this week, and I've made the decision that 2015 is going to be a year for writing. I was dabbling in the last four months of 2014, joining lots of different social groups, making lots of new friends, and I found my place within these groups. And there's this one amazing group called Lead Savages, and they have a writer's meetup. And I went to my first meetup on Halloween and I the first night I was there I read something that I'd written back in 2010 I think and that felt good and I was welcomed and the group were awesome and these are people who I can bounce ideas off of I mean for instance somebody brought up the idea of doing a podcast and it's like that's amazing. Like, I hadn't even mentioned it, and some somebody had mentioned I wanted to do a rise podcast, and I was like, I can help out with that because I've set up my own podcast. Uh, so, on Wednesday evening, I read out something that I'd written, which is part of a greater story that I've been working on since two thousand and five. And it's going to be, this isn't what the podcast is supposed to be about. I know it's supposed to be about my condition, but we're going to get to that. I've got a very interesting new thing (laughs) to uh, read out to you. And I know I teased last week that there is a chapter of 2014 that I didn't go into. Yes, we will go into that. I'm going to talk about lots today. I realised, to, like, having been awake for longer than usual, I usually wake up at, <laughs> whilst when the sun's setting, and it's, it really disappoints me when I do that because I I don't have to hide anymore. You know, my natural instinct is to hide in my bed in my little cocoon, and I I know I'm saying that. I just need to move my cocoon elsewhere, and and this is why I'm I'm in here. Um, If you don't know, it is my car. Well, it's not my car, I don't drive, but I get it because of uh, my disability, and my mum is my registered driver. And so I did ask beforehand because I didn't want to alarm them as to where I was. 
and I uh, said, you know, it's a it's a really windy night. Uh, you probably might be able to hear. I said to them, it's good atmosphere. It's just kind of a, a bunker down feeling that it just really uh, in, inspires me and, and motivates me to talk. You, you can hear it in my voice. I'm talking a lot more uh, profoundly than I would usually do. Probably not profoundly is the right word. Uh, proficiently? Uh, the excerpt that I read out was part of a large story that I've been writing since 2005. Back when I was... Hmm, how old was I? How old was I in 2005? 19? 19. God, oh, so young, so naive. Yeah. I'd been out of education for about... Um, no, I think... Was I... Oh, my God. Yes. I'd been out of ed education for about three months, and in 2004, September 2004, The Sims 2 came along, and this was revolutionary. I I'd been a huge fan of The Sims for about two years beforehand on the PC, but The Sims 2 was just out there so much more. I loved building houses, I, and I loved creating stories, and the stories were where I really found myself. You know, initially I played the game, and then five or six months in, let me explain this as best as I can, to the noobs, noobs, noobs. You start The Sims 2 with three neighborhoods. None of those neighborhoods can interact with each other. So the first one is called Pleasant View. And this has some characters carried over from the first Sims game. So that was the one that I enjoyed playing the most. The characters that come pre-packaged with the game have a little backstory and relationships already formed. But when you start up that game, you can do anything you want with them. You can carry on these relationships, you can break up these relationships, you can kill them off, you can get them pregnant, you can have make them have an affair. And as quite interested in the affair aspect. And because that's where the juicy storylines lie. And there's a great setup that comes with Pleasant View right at the start. Is this character called Don Lothario. He, he doesn't have a backstory. But when you start the game, he's about to get engaged. He is having an affair with a set of twins. None of them know about each other, and that was kind of, that's a heavy backbone of where the story lies, but I relate much more to female characters, so that's where the core of this story lies, and it took on a life of its own as I began writing it. I stopped playing the game and started writing the story and fitting the game to match what I'd written. I introduced some of the other characters from Pleasant View and I had 12 characters to play around with and each different from the other. At least that's what I hoped. I put out the first volume, as I've come to title it. 
and when you're back when the Sims 2 community was in full force, I had some really positive feedback. There was a rating system, all my stories got 5 star ratings. At one point I was like in the top 25 of the highest rated romance stories. And you know, it fueled me to write and I wrote about 75,000 words. I continued writing up until 2006. Then I found myself dealing with my whole uh, coming out issues and realizing, you know, that I needed to make myself happy because I'd been a bit unhappy dealing with my own closeted uh, secrets and what, what not. Nobody knew. It was, it was like, I, it was time. They, I took out a lot of my feelings through this writing. There's a character in this story, which I haven't even told you what it's called. I called it the Caliente Affairs, because the, the twin sisters are the Caliente sisters. But also caliente means hot, so it's the hot affairs. There's a character who's a teenage boy who was coming to terms with being gay, and you know, I didn't have any outlet to express my feelings, and so I channeled it all into him. And I hope I think it, it really shows. <laughs> there there is there are times rereading when the, uh, there are like lines or s paragraphs about him that are just like wow that's that's exactly what I was feeling at that point in life. But it got too much to keep to myself and you know 2007 rolled around and I came out to one person. <laughs> Good for me. Um, my writing dwelled to a trickle and by 2008 it ground to a halt. In 2009 I came out fully, no more hiding, and I started to venture out into the real world and experience. I, I realized I couldn't write anymore because how was I, I, I'd reached this point, this pivotal point, spoiler alert, if you're going to read the Caliente Affairs, just fast forward the next 15 seconds, a character dies, and I'd reached this point where I was like, I don't have any experience to write this chapter, I need to get out and, and live my life. I'd literally been in a closet, not just my sexuality, but my life. I'd been so sheltered. You know, that's what 2014 really kind of came to a head. At the very start of the year, I republished the Caliente Affairs online. It was not met with any response other than clicks. <laughs> I got stats on my website. And now and again, I would see that one person had read the entire series in, in one day because all the episodes, all the chapters had been clicked on. And, you know, that was like, that just that one person, knowing that one person actually took the time to read it, validated my work. And... I stepped back a bit, and put myself back out there into the real world, and as I said right at the start of the podcast, I've found my place now. 2015, I'm going to dedicate to writing volume two. It's basically half written already, because I'm picking up where I ground to a halt in 2008. But 
I'm rewriting it, going over it with a fine tooth comb, adding to it, because I invested a little too much in some characters and neglected others and bringing it all back up, I realised, you know, I've gone through so much, I can actually add to these characters that I couldn't write about before because I didn't know enough about certain aspects of life. You know, this is a 20 year old versus a coming up to, oh God forbid, 29 year old. Oh. And that's the thing. I have too much to say and too few moments left to say it. And if I don't grab the chance now, then it it's going to be lost forever. I can't believe how long I put off writing. You know, when I finally started again on Monday, it was like, it was such a relief. I was like, I've been so afraid to start volume two. And when I did, it was such a relief and everything flowed because it had been in my head for that long that it was just like I'd unleashed everything and I've only written 3,000 words but I'm already satisfied and a thousand of those I read out to the group. So this was the first time ever that I'd actually heard a response. Well, not the first time ever. Well, yeah, the first time I'd ever heard face-to-face -face a response. And the first time I'd got a response since 2008. And I was amazed that the, the response I got back was that I write good conversation and that is where, where I should focus. I, I read out an excerpt between two sisters, the twin sisters, and the feedback I got was they were just in these thousand words, they were believable sisters. And I managed to put across the backstory in what they were saying. I didn't need to add all these colourful words that, that I got told that my, the, the, my conversation, the ability to write dialogue, that's, that's what the word I'm trying to find, I'm really good at it, which I've never heard before, or I hadn't heard in a while, and it, uh, just to know that, to know that I'm not wasting my time, because it, it all stays up in, her, in in my head, and I doubt myself, I doubt myself so much, you heard me last week, I, I have so many doubts, and to know that I can let those doubts go, and they are gone now, and I am unleashed, and I want to get volume 2 out for Valentine's Day, you know, <laughs> because I don't know that's just the date I've got set in my head so basically as I said I've got it half written already I've done 3,000 words in what are we five days six days and um, this does mean however I won't be focusing on the filmmaking which with the group that I've talked about previously I'm not too disheartened about if I want I can I can dip in I dip dip my dip my uh, toe in um but it won't be as an editor it will be as any role that they need me to fill if I so choose. But as it stands, I want to step back from filmmaking and put all my focus into writing volume two of the Colleen Taylor Fest. So you heard it here first. I haven't told anyone. 
well, aside from the writers group, but I I was very sketchy in the fact that it originated from The Sims 2. I told them, which I didn't think I was going to do. I uh, confessed all, um, but, you know, it feels good to, you know, say, yeah, because it's, it's like, where do you draw the line between fiction and fan fiction? Is what I am doing fan fiction because I didn't create the characters? Well, I did create the characters. I drew inspiration from that pre-package and made them my own characters. Ev great literature has drawn inspiration from real life people and turned them into characters. So how is what they did any different to what I'm doing? Just because they were originally fictional characters, it cross it blurs that line between fiction and fan fiction. And I've never read it, but you know, there's a lot of support in fan fiction especially given the recent rise to fame of Fifty Shades of Grey, which started out as Twilight fan fiction. So, you know, there's precedent for something that you wouldn't necessarily think could be a viable published platform turning into a, a movie. I love, in my head, in my head, the Caliente Affairs is, it's set in the Southern Hemisphere, it's set in some kind of undisclosed Australian offshore island with its kind of, that's also kind of heavily in, influenced by America. It's kind of a fictitious setting but on earth because i've referenced england there's there's a character from england that, that i created i created a character there are there are my creations in there that, that are completely pulled from my imagination actually i'll tell you the origin it's it's kind of oh i don't know if i should um if you read volume one there are two characters from England called Sean and Ed, and I created them based on the characters from Sean of the Dead. Um, and that was before I actually inserted them into the story. Back when I was playing it in 2004, I created the characters to play with myself in like their own start at home and have them get jobs. And they Ed started having an affair with one of the twins and they found themselves in the story and they were my first non prepackaged characters. It's it's quite nice that they're English and based on Shaun of the Dead and Shaun of the Dead has quite a cool following, so I don't know, maybe maybe when, maybe if, maybe when. Caliente Affairs, or whatever it, its that incarnation ends up getting called, gets out into the wider known public. Some people will be able to say, ah, Sean and Ed, based on Sean of the Dead. So that was <laughs> my Wednesday. <laughs> We've only got to Wednesday. On Tuesday, I had a transfusion, and my medication is going very well. My drug, Trial of Eprex, the erythropoietin drug. She's still, I'm still not entirely sure what it does. But whatever it's doing, it's doing a little bit of something because my blood count was the highest it's ever been for a transfusion, which was 10.6. Now I'm using old speak. They've changed it now, 
instead of 10.6 they say 106 so they've just got rid of the decimal essentially but i had a full set of blood tests done uh, and seeing a brand new doctor next week because my doctor is on a cn <laughs> what's that word um he's on a he's gone to work somewhere else and i it's got this really nice word and i sometimes I could, i've only just learned it see another thing about this writers group you hear other people's works and i'm learning so many new phrases and words and it's so great when I when I don't have anything to read out, I bring along a notepad and pen and write down phrases and words and as like that I love, and I think I I must find a way to use that in my own writing. Seconda. Isn't that a lovely word? Don't know what it means. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole again. Remember when I started defining words? As it happened, the week that I put that podcast out, I found Susie Dent on Twitter. So you can follow Susie Dent if you listen. If you've listened to that episode, I referenced Susie Dent, and you can follow her, which I'm pretty sure it's at Susie underscore. Now back to these blood tests. I have the results in front of me. I'm afraid to say you have congenital erythropoietic palsy. <gasps> oh no. What does that mean? It means you're going to live to be 10 years old. But doctor, I'm turning 29 this <laughs> year. <laughs> That's what I got told. Well, that's what I, that's what my mum got told. She got told I was going to live to be 10 years old. Now, I was talking with my good friend Carrie. You remember Carrie from episode 4? I think it was episode 4, yeah. And I was going to record the podcast that day. But, again, I wasn't, I didn't have my little cocoon. I was too self-conscious. I'm not at that point in my confidence yet, where I can just whip out a microphone and talk to you without it, you know, I have to put it into context, I have to have somebody there who I am talking to. I was going to do it with Carrie, as she apologised, she had to go because she's a mother now, you know, so, um, Whilst I was there, though, I had a lovely conversation with a new friend um, who's getting treatment radiotherapy up until February and heartwarming that he actually asked if I was in because I was hiding away in my little corner. You know, in the back of my head, I was like, I'll come here because, you know, if I get the feeling to record, it's a good position to be in. But as it happened, I didn't. So I was hidden away. So he asked if I was there. Somebody actually asked that I'd only met once before, the two weeks before. And we had a, a conversation about music, uh, which is great. Yeah, it's really, it's, I say all the time, I find it so hard to make friends and make conversation but when it happens I'm good at it and I surprise myself I always see it's those self-doubts again and that's another self-doubt that I can kiss goodbye to and another doubt I can kiss goodbye to is the doubt that this eprex is not working because judging by my blood count it's doing something So I was talking to Carrie, as I remembered what I was talking about. I was talking to Carrie, and as it happened, I had these blood results in front of me, and so we were looking over them. And the major one that 
I need to really keep an eye on. Huh. I need to keep an eye on my iron. The ferritin levels. I looked it up on Google. I had no idea what a ferritin was. Ferritin is like a substance that carries iron. So the higher your ferritin levels are, the more iron you have in your body. And conveniently, these blood tests come with a reference for your average person. So an average person has 10 to 322 units of ferritin in their body. That's their ferritin levels. It can go a standard person, an average person in their blood can have as high as 322. My ferritin level is 4,738. <laughs> That's very bad. That is an iron overload. But that is because of all the transfusions, which is why I'm on this ePrex to not have to rely on the transfusions every two weeks, which it looks like it's going to work. And this is huge. I've the only treatment I've had to bring down my iron levels is Desferil, a drug called Desferioxamine. Starting when I was 12, I went on a constant infusion. And this was great, brought down my ferritin, kept them at a, a safe level. However, I didn't, I'd, I'd made the decision when I was um, 25 that I didn't want to be on the infusions anymore because I had to walk around with this pump that deflated and fed the infusion. And I felt very guarded. I felt very protected. I didn't feel... I mean, uh, this has a lot to do with my Hickman line as well. It's, it's like walking out of hospital with a drip stand. And then, you know, saying, I'm going to go on a bus and I'm going to go shopping. And all the while, you got this trip stand with you. It's essentially like that. But it's in your pocket. And so, I, I, you know, I wore baggy clothes. I protected one side of my body and the, the muscle on my arm that I used as a shield. I think we've gone over this, but I'm just reiterating the point that I lived a sheltered life. And I do think it came in conjunction with, you know, being out, coming out. And I didn't want to live like that anymore. And as it happened, there was an alternative, an alternative called X-Jade. And this was a dissolvable tablet that you drank. So I started that in 2012 and you know that led the way to being able to have my line removed and you know obviously you know the change that you know I've just been um, unleashed. I um, feel like I'm actually living my life anew. You know, yeah, I'm just trying to think. It, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes when, when I'd say it out loud. Whatever amount of time I have left, you know, I don't want to die in a hospital bed. I want to be out living life. 
and you know, it really hit home and having someone in my life die, my grandma, being at that funeral and being like, you know, you can be in Norway one year and then dead the next. It, it's, it is life, that's how life is. I guess she, I mean, she was 94, but you know, essentially my body is, is aging and it's, it's not as strong as other people's, so, you know, I have to be realistic. I, I have an older body. And this is on top of the fact that I am allergic to sunlight. And so I was talking with Carrie and she thought my condition was that I had too much iron, that my body produced too much iron. And that, you know, I said to her, no, the only reason I have too much iron is because I have to have the transfusions because my own bone marrow produces red blood cells that break apart, deposit these things, very, very scientific analysis, these things called erythropoietin things, and usually a, a regular person, all your blood is, is locked in that cell, and that cell goes around your body again and again and again, doing its job my cells don't do that, which is why I need to replace them, regenerate them, get new cells, because they break apart and these deposits of erythropoietin cells, they deposit all over my body and they're what cause my skin to react to sunlight because it's a photosensitive. No, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm only, I only know what people tell me. Why? Well, I, I should ask more, but you ask a doctor and it, the doctor just goes into... They don't, they don't speak. I didn't find out half of this until 2007. Because you talk to a doctor and the doctor's never deal, dealt with this before. A doctor has only knows hematology. This condition is so rare and archaic that they, they know as much that is documented. So I have to be the one to tell them. So it pays to get informed because I'm, I'm going to meet a new doctor next week and it's going to be a case of me telling them what I want for my treatment. I'm going to try upping the dosage of this Eprex and we'll, we will go three weeks without a transfusion. The crowd goes wild. It's been so long since I've gone three weeks without a transfusion. This will completely change the results of my blood. My platelets will go up. My white count should go up. Because these are other things that actually come down through having a transfusion. My iron levels come up and my platelets come down. It's, it's very odd. Having an infusion of red blood cells actually you know, it, it does good and then it does bad as well. It, well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very, very complicated. Hi, I'm Thomas McNabb. You've been listening to Tom's Brain. It's complicated. <laughs> Starring Sarah Jessica Parker. Did I handle that very well? Mixing the real life with the medical life. Is, I feel very conflicted. I want to deliver an entertaining podcast. Which means informing you, keeping a diary, 
but then I want to create a document of living with the condition that is so rare so that if anyone else is born and has to live with it, there is, you know, they don't have to feel alone. So, uh, I had feedback for my f fiction. I'd really love some feedback as to whether I'm achieving my goal. You know, I'm only into episode A, but I, I think, I hope we're going in the right direction. I keep nattering at Katie to do the podcast. Katie, my stepsister, who's not really my stepsister, who's my like my creative counterpart. But she is so busy. She's a busy recording artist about to release her first single. So that's exciting for her. But I want you know what, we've had a lot of history and I just, I can't wait to introduce her to you. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, that won't, won't be so much as my illness. I'll keep, oh, you know, I'll obviously bring it back to me that, you know, she wants the promotion. And I'm saying, I will promote you on my podcast. So no more free promotion, Katie whose band I won't announce until she gets on the podcast. <laughs> but there's an... Oh my god! I've run out of time and I haven't told you about what I was going to tease you about! Oh. To be continued. At the start of the next episode, I'm going to tell you all about how I applied to be on The Undateables. There. I've said it now, so I have to tell the story. This has been something that I, I have not shared because I did it in a haze of, of delirium. And... Uh, look, we'll get into it at the start of the next podcast. Until then, I've been Thomas Bernard. You can keep in contact with me by email tomspring2 at yahoo.co.uk on Twitter, lgbtom via Facebook, facebook.com forward slash tomsbrain. You can like the Facebook page for the podcast, which nobody has done yet, so I don't know why I keep reiterating. Facebook.com forward slash Tom's Brain Pod. Those are all the relevant informations that I need to leave at the end of the podcast. Rate, review, subscribe. I love you all. This has been such a cathartic experience. Finally getting all these words off my chest that I've been meaning to do since Wednesday. I'm sorry it's late, but I will make up for it by coming at you right on time next week with the story of when I applied to be on.